and 6137. We reach out to you this week to help you get connected with all of the exciting things happening here at the Met. In the lobby at our guest services counter, we also have a welcome gift just for you. So stop by for your special gift and to meet one of our pastors. One of the best ways to learn more about the Met is through our Met Church app. There you can stay up to date with events and services like our guest lunch. Guest lunch is an informational lunch just for you. You will learn about our history, our vision, and how you fit into the work that God is doing here. This is a great first step if you're new to the Met and want to know more about us. Once again, we are so glad that you decided to join us. Now please enjoy the rest of the service.
Amen. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Why don't you all go ahead and put a big old smile on your face and uh, greet the people around you, shake their hands, introduce yourself, and then you keep on standing and singing with us.
arms wide open pouring out my life gracefully broken amen amen you may be seated it is great to have you here on a Sunday morning, and we just want to let you know there was a little thing that happened this past week. It's called Wow Week. It was an amazing, amazing week. It's for your elementary kids, and we just wanted you that didn't get to experience to get a little bit of taste of what was going on this past week here at the Met. We definitely have uh, blessed with the best uh, children's team that you can have around. They are just amazing, amazing. They do amazing things with your kids every week, and, and Wow Week was just unbelievable. And what was really even more unbelievable was all the people that volunteered to make this happen. We had so many volunteers. I just want to give it up for all the volunteers that made that happen. <laughs> great, great stuff. Life change was going on. I mean, it is just great. If your kids are not involved in what's going on in our, our Met Kids area, they are missing out. It's just uh, phenomenal, phenomenal what they do over there, so make sure they're a part of that. And and speaking of life change, we've got somebody who said, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I want to go public with my faith through baptism. And we get excited about baptism here, so come on, give it up for him. Let's go. Let's give it up for Donovan Miller. I know you're excited about this. You've been waiting for this day for a long time. And what a great gift to be able to give to your family to, to, to finally, on this Father's Day, to be able to say, you know what, I trust my spiritual father. I put my faith in him. And Donovan, and it's because of your faith in God and in Jesus that I get to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in new life. one more time. Always exciting. It's all exciting. We got to see him at the other services, and it's just, it's great to, to be a part of that life change, and that's why we ask you to continue to bring your lost friends, your neighbors, your co-workers. Bring them here, because you can be a part of somebody's life being changed forever, and uh, it's always so in incredible to be a part of that, and that's why we love what we do here at the church, and that we, we want everybody here to, to meet Jesus Christ, and uh, so we're so thankful for that. Right now, we'd love for you to continue to worship with us. <laughs> Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow. The ransom for my life always oh, my soul you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails. Yeah. 
You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. Stop your love And you would wage a war Try to take the very thing You gave your life for And you would come running And tear down every wall All the while you're shouting My love, you're worth it all God Yeah. 
Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning, and God, we do. We thank you for your unstoppable love. God, we thank you that nothing can stand between us. Nothing that we've done in our past, no sin that we've committed, no shame that we carry, nothing can stand between us. So God, if we came in this morning carrying something or Maybe we just feel guilty being in church or maybe we feel like we're not good enough and we've just done too much for you to love us. God, I pray right now that you'd break our hearts down. God, that you would speak to us and show us your love today. God, that we are worth it. No matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, God, your love is still sufficient. Your love is still available to us because nothing, can keep us from you. So God, I pray we just lay that down today. Whatever it is that's on our minds, whatever it is that's keeping us down, that's a burden today, God, that we just let it go right now. God, that we lay it down at your feet. Lord, that we receive your love today. God, pour your Holy Spirit out. Change us, mold us. Speak to our hearts today. God, help us to walk out of here knowing how much you love us. God, we thank you so much for a place that we can come and worship and that we can be filled with your Holy Spirit, that we can feel your presence. God, I pray for our offering today, Lord, that you would use it to expand your kingdom, God, that more people could come and feel you. More people would come to know you. God, I pray you bless everyone in here. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. The ushers will be coming forward in just a moment, but first, let's see what is happening here at the Met. Hi, my name is Amber, and this is your Met Five. This past weekend, dozens of our Met Church members grabbed their work gloves and spent their free time serving with our community relief team. We were able to complete projects for four different families in need in our community. Our team shared the love of Jesus in such a tangible way, not only with smiles and hugs, but with hard work in the hot sun, simply to bless these deserving families. If you'd like to donate your time with our next relief event, simply email outreach at metchurch.com. If you're unable to volunteer, you can always donate towards our efforts by texting any amount plus the keyword HELP OUT to 30131. The Met's mission with our food pantry is to provide a place where people in need can receive food assistance as well as support to get involved in activities that will assist them in growth towards a brighter tomorrow. Every month we have a different Dropbox item for you to donate to our food pantry. This month's Dropbox item is baby food in plastic containers and individually packaged snacks. You can drop these off in the Dropbox station located at the front of the lobby by our youth room. June 24th is our pre-K celebration. It will include a memorable party with some of our puppet friends, fun worship songs, a celebration certificate, and a picture with our kids' ministry staff. At the end of the celebration, parents will receive valuable insight on how Met Kids can partner with them as they impress long-lasting faith in the hearts of their children. Kids entering kindergarten are eligible to participate in the preschool celebration, and you can get your child registered at the registration counter in the lobby. Summer Style is the greatest event for students to be a part of on Wednesday nights over the summer. It provides our students with an opportunity to disconnect from their busy and rhythmic lives and to engage God in a variety of fun and focused environments. Every Summer Style evening is completely free, food included. Our next Summer Style event will be on June 20th from 6.30 to 9.30. No registration is required, just come ready to hang out and have some fun. If you're not already volunteering somewhere, we are looking for fun, outgoing people to help with our experience team. This team will help provide a great experience for our guests and members this summer. Stop by the info counter to find out more and to sign up to volunteer today. For all the details and information or to register for any of our events, you can always visit our website at metchurch.com or visit the information counter in the lobby. 
Thanks for watching. I'm Amber, and this was your Met Five. in the Joshua tree if we pass in the night then just hand me a light and tell me you burn just like me I'm a little bit steady but still a little bit rolling stone I'm a little bit heaven but still a little bit flesh and bone. little foul little don't know where I am I'm a little Happy Father's Day. Let's give it up for all the men, all the dads in the room. 
Awesome. In fact, dads, why don't you stand? Let's just do this right. Let's recognize all the dads, granddads, wherever you are, everywhere in the room. God bless you, fellas. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all you do. Did you enjoy the flyover this morning and, or the parade or the breakfast in bed? Did all that happen at your house? Yeah, I thought it was just me. I was just great to, great to see all of you this morning. You know, I've been doing ministry for a long time. In fact, in about 43 years of ministry, I have done hundreds of weddings. I did one last week, and the groom asked me, how many weddings do you think you've done? And I, honestly, I, I have no idea. I've done a lot of them, and they're so interesting. Each one of them is unique. And uh, I always like to tell the couples when they're getting married, here it is. Marriage is the end of your trouble. But it's the front end. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of problems, but it's, going, it's worth it. It's going to be okay. You'll make it, right? Uh, and so in, in this whole situation of, of doing weddings and understanding the value of marriage, we, we, we see a story in the New Testament that really gives me opportunity to make some application for fathers today that I hope will encourage you guys and bless you as we look at this story. Now understand, uh, weddings in the Bible time in the first century were very different than they are in our day. Our day, you know how it goes. You have the rehearsal, and you have the rehearsal dinner, and generally the groom picks up the tab on that. And then you have the wedding, and then you have the wedding after party, the celebration, and the bride's family typically picks up the tab on that. And that's generally how they go in a traditional uh, wedding sense. Now, when Cindy and I got married, it was very different. We celebrated last week 41 years of marriage. Can you believe that? Oh, my word. And, uh, and when we got married, it was the wedding, and then it was punch and cake. Punch and cake. That was our reception, right? Now it's like they fly in somebody from Italy to do an ice sculpture. Uh, you, you've got, uh, you know, the, uh, the symphony that comes in to play. In fact, I've talked to numerous brides who told me, do you know my dad pulled me aside and said he would buy me a car? or he would give the down payment on a house if I would just elope. <laughs> Dad sharpened his pencil and realized, wow, I would come out a lot cheaper on that deal. Well, that's the American wedding. That's how they're done typically today. But in the first century, it was very different. You're gonna love this if you have daughters. Did you know in the first century, the groom's dad and the groom were responsible for the whole thing? Can I hear a hallelujah from all the fathers of daughters? Some of you think, we need to go back. That's in the Bible. We need to go back to those days, right? But that was how it, that's how they rolled, that you were responsible. If you were the dad of a, of, a, of a son that was getting married, you would pay for the whole thing. Now, we're not talking about rehearsal, rehearsal, dinner, wedding, reception. We're talking about a seven-day event. Can you imagine? Seven days. It was a wedding festival. In fact, if you were invited to a wedding in that day. You would come and the groom's father would host you. He would provide housing for you. He would provide entertainment for you. It was his duty and obligation to you as his guest to make sure you're completely happy. He would provide for you the very best wine, the very best that he had. Everything was done so that the guests would feel at home. You see, back in that day, it was what was called a shame and honor society. And in a shame and honor society, if you dishonored your guest who had showed up for your wedding, you would bring shame on your family. It would be a terrible reflection on you as a dad, and it would uh, be a bad indicator for this young couple as they're launching their lives together. So there were a lot of pressure on the dad, particularly the dad of the groom, to make sure everything went well. And it was expensive. Can you imagine the guest list? And you're looking over the guest list knowing, I'm going to have to entertain these people. I'm going to have to house these people. I'm going to have to feed these people. I'm going to have to serve these people wine for seven days. And that's how they rolled back in that day. And so it's interesting that when we study this narrative and from it draw some application for fathers today, that this was the event where Jesus' ministry would come to fruition. It is where he would finally go public. If you have a Bible, look in John chapter 2. We're going to see this. This is the famous passage that we've heard so much about of water to wine. In fact, it's the first miracle Jesus ever performed, turning water into wine. 
I remember that priest getting pulled over. He was bumping the yellow line a little bit and speeding and failing to maintain his lane. And the officer pulled him over and said, Father, you know why I stopped you? He said, you're failing to maintain the lane. You're bumping the yellow line. You're speeding. And he said, Father, have you been drinking? He goes, no, I just have a bottle of water here. He says, let me see that bottle of water. He said, Father, that's not water. That's wine. And he says, praise the Lord. He did it again. <laughs> I don't know. It just fit right there. So in John chapter 2, in John chapter 2, you see this incredible wedding, and the Bible says it was the third day. Now understand, that means it was three days into the seven-day festival. So on the third day, you have the wedding, and that's typically how it happened. You would have a few days of pre-wedding celebration, the wedding, and then you'd have a couple of days of post-wedding celebration, and then the bride and groom would run off together as they do today and leave the rest of us with their drunk family members. So anyway, so there, this wedding took place, the Bible says, in Cana in Galilee. Now that was just a few miles from where Jesus lived in Nazareth. So here they are in Cana, and note now, Jesus' mother was there. Now, that's significant because she was there, when you study context and you really read this and study it, you'll understand she was there more or less as what we would call today the wedding coordinator. So Jesus' mother was responsible for kind of putting everything together, the event, if you will, itself. So she's there, a very prominent position. Now, we don't know who the family was that's getting married. We don't know the groom. We don't know the bride. We don't know the families of these young couples. We don't know that. We just know they were close to Jesus and to his mother, Mary. And so we understand that this father had asked Mary, obviously, if she would step up and help, you know, put all this together. She agreed. So Mary is there. And notice now, not only was Mary there, but Jesus and disciples had been invited to the wedding. Now, let me stop and kind of say this parenthetical. So many times people think that when you become a Christ follower, all the happiness and joy leaves your life. You know, that the sadder you are, the surer you are for heaven. You know? And as a Christian, you're just supposed to go around with a sad, forlorn look on your face all the time. You're never to enjoy your life. It, you know, that Christianity is something you just don't want to get because you may not get over it. And, and people have a, a very bad understanding of what it means to be a Christ follower. I mean, when I look at John 10, 10, he said, I came to give you life and give it to the full. The, the Bible says God has given us all things richly to enjoy Enjoy. Sometimes we need to pull the groans out of our prayers and shove in a few hallelujahs. I, I meet some Christians and I say, man, if there's joy in your heart, notify your face. <laughs> I mean, it ought to be a reflection somewhere out there that you really have Jesus there. And I'm saying all that to say Jesus is at a party. He is at a wedding feast. He has been there three days. Never think that our Lord did not enjoy life. Even though he was laser focused on his mission was to going to the cross, he had a wonderful experience living his life. I think he had a lot of laughter in his life. I think he had a lot of joy in his life. I think he enjoyed people. He spent so much time with them. I think he enjoyed his apostles. He spent so much time with them. And I just say that to simply say, don't miss the significance that Jesus is at this wedding. He's enjoying himself. He's laughing and he's having a good time with everyone. And by the way, no one there at this point even knows really who he is. They know he was a carpenter. His dad was a carpenter by trade. Joseph isn't mentioned in the narrative, which leads us to believe Joseph has probably already died. And so Jesus is still with his mom. He's still probably doing his father's business as a carpenter, and that's how they know him. He's got his close friends that we will know later are his disciples, or apostles. But at this point, it's just Jesus and his buddies. And they're hanging out at this party. And all of a sudden, notice the wine is gone. This is a disaster. I mean, to understand the shame and honor culture to run out of something as important as wine. There was a rabbinical symbol that wine was symbolic of joy. And that if you had a wedding and you hosted a guest and you didn't offer wine, it was considered an insult. Water was scarce. Milk couldn't be preserved. Wine was a staple drink. And so here at this party, I mean, with these guests that have been invited, uh, they run out of wine. How in the world could that have happened? How do you host a party and bring these people in on the most important occasion of your family life and you run out of wine? So I just, I just want to underscore what a disaster this is, because you might miss it if you just read over that quickly. 
So Jesus' mother says to him, they have no more wine. Now, when you read this, you don't get inflection. But mama was amped. (laughs) Mama was excited. She was so concerned that this is such a huge faux pas. Did you know even when you study the culture, did you know you could have brought in that day legal charges against the host, against the dad, if he insulted you as the guest? Can you imagine? Uh, Somebody dried the fish out. You'll be talking to my attorney. Can you imagine? Now, I can't find record where anyone actually did that, but they had the legal right to do it. I'm just underscoring that to say there was a pressure on the dad. This dad had an enormous amount of pressure, not only to pay for this, but to provide for his guests and then to run out of wine. So Mary goes to Jesus. We're out of wine. We're out of wine. This is a disaster. And notice (laughs) verse 4, the response of Jesus. Notice this. Woman. (laughs) Now, let me say something. (laughs) Uh, Unless you are the only begotten son of the sovereign living God. Never refer to your mother or your wife as woman. Can I hear an amen on that one right there? Oh my Lord, don't, don't, just, just, just don't go there. Don't go there. But that's not really what it means when you understand context. When you look at this setting in that day, that was not an affront. It was not an insult like we would receive it today. It wasn't in that day. And that day, it was actually a term of endearment. It was like a knight referring to his sweetheart as my lady, right? It was a term of, in fact, if you go to John 19, you see Jesus at the cross. What does he refer to Mary as? He says, woman, behold thy son. Same word, same expression, different context. But I'm just saying, so you understand, when you read this, if I don't explain that, you'll think, was he, was he being hateful to his mother? <laughs> what was happening? No, 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 not at all. And and notice his response, why do you involve me? I mean, Mary knew you're the son of God. These people need to know it. At this time, we know Jesus was about 29 years of age, 30. And she's saying, it's time to launch. (laughs) These people need to know who you are. I mean, she knew who he was. Remember, the angel appeared to her and said, you're going to have a son. He's going to be the son of the most high God. Uh, You'll call his name Jesus. He'll save his people from their sins, Matthew 1, 21. She knew who he was. When she went and gave him to Simeon to be circumcised in the temple, uh, Simeon, the high priest, said, I'm ready to die. And my eyes have now seen the Lord's Christ. I've seen the Messiah. He's here. So Mary knew who he was. At 12 years of age, he's in the temple confounding the rabbis and the lawyers. He's so smart to be 12. What? This is a child unlike any other child. So Mary's thinking, Jesus, you're 29. Let's get this show on the road, man. Let's let these people know you're the son of God. And Jesus says, it's just not, you know, look, I'm on a different timetable than you. My schedule isn't quite your schedule. And it's even indicated in how he refers to her. He didn't say, mother, why do you involve me? He says, woman indicating to Mary and perhaps all of us who will read this later that the relationship has changed. There's a relationship you have with your parents. When you're under their roof and you're under your care, your relationship is to obey. Uh, Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. So we obey. But once you're on your own, you're grown, and you come into your own, now it's not necessarily obedience, it's honor. And to honor means I give weight to them. That's what the word literally means. It means to give weight to, meaning I weigh their opinion stronger than someone else's opinion. I consider their counsel heavier than I do other people's counsel. This this is just basically what it means. So Jesus was more or less saying to his mom, look, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to make these decisions. Let me determine when this needs to happen. Not you, mom, love you, but why do you involve me here? And Jesus replied, my hour is not yet come. I'll know when it's time, and you'll see it's just about time. Notice the next part of the narrative. His mother said to the servants, notice she's not offended. She says, do whatever he tells you. And by the way, can I tell you that's some of the best advice you'll ever get out of the Bible. Do whatever he tells you. Can I tell you that still works in 2018? Do whatever he tells you. Whatever's in this word, just do whatever he tells you. You can't do what you shouldn't do if you'll keep doing what you should do. Because the minute you're doing what you should not do, it's because you stopped doing what you should have been doing. So she's saying, if you'll do what he tells you to do, you won't be doing what you shouldn't be doing. So do whatever he tells you. Great advice, right? Great advice. Do whatever he tells you to do. So nearby, nearby, this is significant. It was in the house. 
Nearby stood six stone water jars. Now, the answer to the problem was in their house. I don't want you to miss this. I'm trying to apply it as we go through it. The answer to their problem was in their house. Can I tell you that principle carries true today? The thing God will use to meet the need of your life is already in your house. It is already in your sphere. It's in your orbit. Uh, God doesn't do the miraculous in the things that you have lost. He does the miraculous in the things you have left. You remember the woman who only had the, the little bit of meal in the barrel and a little bit of oil in the jar, and she was going to, in First Kings, she was going to fix herself one more meal for she and her son, and then she figured she'd just die. And Jesus blessed it through the prophet and multiplied it, and the Bible says the meal never wasted and the oil never went away. What happened? He did a miracle, not in what she had lost, not in the husband who had died. She did, he did the miracle in the things that she had left. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how it works. The answer to the problem of the wine was in the house. So it's six water stone jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. Now, theologically, that's that's important because he's about to change the old system of the Old Testament economy of purification by putting new wine, which is an indicator of a New Testament. There's going to be a new covenant, and he's preparing the way for that. That's the theological symbolism of all this. But practically speaking, here was a jars, big 20 to 30 gallon jars, that he's going to do an incredible thing when he turns this water water into the wine. So he says, fill them with water. They fill them to the brim. And notice what happens. Then he told them, draw some of the water out. Take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. And he didn't realize where it had come from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he didn't realize what Jesus had done. They did. So notice what happens. He calls the bridegroom aside. He says, man, everyone typically brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after your guests are too drunk to know the difference, but loosely translated. (laughs) That's really what it means. (laughs) But you have saved, note now, the best till now. Can I say that's how God still works? He saves the best sometimes till the last. So you say the best till now. And what Jesus, note now, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first, this was the first miracle of the signs through which he revealed his glory, he revealed who he was, and his disciples believed on him. Can I give you one little quick thing about miracles in the Bible? This will help you. Miracle is a word that's never used by God to describe what he does. Jesus never did this and said, I didn't know I could do that, that's pretty cool. I may try that again sometime. It's never a word he uses to describe what he does. A miracle is a word we use to describe something we can't explain. Put it in a medical context. A doctor may say, your recovery is nothing short of miraculous. It's just a word used to describe something that can't be described. It's not something God uses but it's to describe what he does, but it's something we use. So miracles in the Bible had three particular purposes. This is just sidebar to what I'm talking about this morning, but it's interesting. The first thing he used miracles to do was that he would use them to confirm a prophet or to confirm a prophecy. You see it throughout the Old Testament. So that this prophet and the people would know he speaks for God, she speaks for God. So the prophecy would be true. Miracles would accompany it to uh, confirm a prophecy or a prophet. Number two, miracles in the Bible were confirmed or, or, or were performed to commence a program. Anytime you read God doing something new in the Bible, it was always preceded or accompanied by something miraculous. Acts chapter 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit, a miraculous event. So it is to to confirm a prophet, to commence a program. Number three, miracles were performed to convince people, to convince people. You see what happened? After this, the disciples believed in him. All of a sudden, his buddy said, wow, wow. Who has this kind of power unless he's from God, unless he's of God? So it's to convince people. Read John 20, 31. It says, there are many other things Jesus did that aren't included in this Bible, but the things that are there are written, here it is, so that you might believe. It's all about convincing us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So this miracle was performed. And this was an incredible thing. Think about this. It saved that young couple enormous shame. It helped this poor dad that was desperate. He didn't know what he was going to do. And Jesus steps in and performs the first miracle. And what a beautiful miracle it was. Now, dads, let me give you three things to think about, and we're going to go home. 
The first thing I want you to consider is what I call, here was a family man. This father, this groom's father, was a man totally committed to his family. You say, where do you get that from the text? Well, just the fact he was hosting the event with all that I just told you that is entailed in this kind of event tells me this man loved his family. Can I say the men in this room love your family? The men that will watch this message later love their families. You are a provider for your family. You work hard. You do everything you do to make sure they have, and not just materially, you provide for them emotionally. You try to be connected with them. You, 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 you see after their spiritual needs. You wouldn't be here this morning if you weren't a good man. I mean, you've given up your father. Oh, the one Sunday of the weekend, nobody would give you grief about going to church. You could say, hey, it's Father's Day. I can do what I want to do. Right? <laughs> you could, but you're here. So I'm saying this was a good man. This was a man who was providing for his family, a man who was protecting his family, who cared deeply about his family, willing to sacrifice so much so that his family would have what they need. So I don't want you to miss that when you understand the significance of this unnamed dad in the story, and that is this is a dad totally committed to looking after his family. But not only was he a family man, but the second thing you see, and this is the heart of that narrative, is he was a fatigued man. (laughs) All of a sudden, man, he's a man with no wine. In the midst of all the things he was doing for his kids, they ran out of wine. Wine in the Bible, by the way, is symbolic of joy. Read Amos 9, the 104th Psalm, many other places I could take you, where wine is symbolic of joy. It is used as a metaphor to describe. Not only that, in Ephesians 5.18, wine is analogous to the Holy Spirit. Be not drunk with wine wherein it is excess, but be you being filled, continually filled with the Holy Spirit. So here is a man, if I could draw the analogy and the application, here is a man who's lost his joy. I mean, he's running on empty. He's fatigued. In the midst of providing for his family, in the midst of trying to be everything he could be, in the midst of seeing that his family was taken care of, trying to honor his family, in the midst of that situation, he runs out of wine. Man, what a disaster to have run out of wine. By the way, the wine ran out in the house Jesus was in. Did you know you can run out of wine in a house where Jesus lives? Did you know you can love God, serve God, know God, and run out of wine? (laughs) You can be in the midst of doing everything you're supposed to do, being the best person you can possibly be, providing and trying to set an example for your family and connect and love them, and all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're running on empty. The joy is gone. The wine is gone. Suddenly you find yourself doing what you do because it's your duty to do it. The passion is gone. The song, the thrill is gone. I mean, the joy has just left. And I would just ask you guys, how many of you this morning, if you're really honest with yourself, would say the wine is either gone or it's going fast? It's hard to get us guys to admit that because we put the front up and we put the strong face on and we try to be all that we can be. And the reality is, sometimes, guys, if you don't watch those gauges, you can run on empty. And by the way, a guy can run on empty for a while. And no one, did you know they ran out of wine and nobody knew it at first? Only Mary, the coordinator, closest to it, and then the father would have been the, the way in which that was, he was notified. And at that point, at the point of the story, no one else knew they were out of wine. Can I tell you guys that's how it works? That's how it works. Initially, nobody knows you're running on empty but you. And you may not know you're running on empty until you come to a service like this and you hear somebody like me ask you to think about that and suddenly you think about it and you realize, I've been running on empty a long time. And most of the time, guys, it's because we just don't watch the gauges. I use that as, that's a guy term, gauges. We don't watch them. When you read 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul said, I pray to God that your spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. We call that trichotomy, that you are a spirit and a soul that inhabits a body. I'll give you another way. You are emotional, you are physical, you are spiritual. And every one of those components of your life has a gauge. You only get so much energy. Read Matthew 5. He says, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof in the King Jimmy. How, that's, how you apply that is God gives you enough, you, that gives you what you need to get through your day. He doesn't give you any more. 
What happens when you start worrying and fretting and stressing over your finances, your health, your family, you're starting borrowing fuel that you don't yet have. And all of a sudden you find yourself burning fuel that you don't have and it isn't long until you find yourself depleted and you run out of wine. Let me ask you guys on this Father's Day weekend, how are the gauges? One of my best friends uh, at Fellowship Church in Grand Junction, uh, Dan and Hooper and I, we've been buddies since high school. And when his daughter started driving a few years ago, they got her a car, and she called him one day on the side of the road, and the engine was done. She had just burned the car up. So he was so frustrated. So he goes, and he says, find out, what happened? What happened? Uh, didn't you see the, the engine light? You know, the, the mechanics of the engine light. She, didn't you see the engine light? She goes, no, I didn't see it. Well, he gets in the car and he sits down behind the wheel and he looks at it and she has over the engine light a picture of her boyfriend. <laughs> Cost him a couple thousand dollars. He hates that guy to this day. <laughs> I'm just saying, fellas, what's keeping you from watching the gauges? If you're not careful, you, you don't look at the gauges and before you know it, you're emotionally depleted, you are physically de depleted. When's the last time you took some time off? You know, the Bible talks about a sabbatical rest. You need, to, you need to chill. You need to rest. I hear people, well, you know, I'm a guy. I'd rather burn out as rust out. I hear that. I'd rather burn out as rust out. Well, that sounds tough, but fellas, either way you go, you're out. <laughs> Out's out. You can burn out or you can rust out, but you're still out. I'm just saying, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. You need to take care of yourself. Watch the gauges. And I'm, I'm talking from experience, it, it just about eight years ago, man, I was running every day, about six miles a day, probably the best shape I'd been in my life, but I ignored, I wasn't going to the doctor, wasn't really watching the gauges, had this pain in my side, I ignored, I'd stop running, I'd walk a little bit, it'd go away and pick up, start running again. Then it got to where if I just walked down a flight of stairs, it hit me in the side again, I thought, man, that's weird, but oh well. Then it got to the point where I'd step out here before I came out to speak, and there were several weekends I'd been back there like this going, man, if this doesn't go away, I don't think I can go out there and do that. So I just asked, man, Lord, you're going to have to, I mean, really, I'm going to have to mail it in. I can't do this. So I made the biggest mistake of my life at that time that ended up saving my life, and that is I told Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, you're going to the doctor. Well, I'm at the doctor Monday morning. He's got a stethoscope on my chest, and he listens a little bit. He says, you're going to the hospital right now. I said, can I go get a change of clothes? He goes, yeah, you go get a change of clothes, and then you go straight to the Baylor Grapevine. So we go home and I'm getting stuff. And so about 40 minutes later, his nurse calls me. She says, where are you? I said, I'm at Lonesome Spur eating a cheeseburger. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> she said, you're supposed to be at the hospital. The doctor's here waiting on you. And I thought, is this serious? This must be serious. You know? And so I get there, well, long story short, cath lab later and just, just dodged open heart surgery by hair. Three stents later, he comes in and tells, talks to me in, in the cardiac intensive care, and he goes, you know what, Bill? Your LAD, your left interior descending, I believe it's called, it's, the nickname's Widowmaker, oh, that'll bless you, uh, was 96, 97% blocked. He said, if that would have closed, you would have experienced what we call sudden cardiac death. You'd have been dead before you hit the floor, and you people would have another pastor. So sorry about that part. But the point is, <laughs> the point is, I, I'm in great shape, right? I'm watching the gauges. He told me, he goes, man, it has nothing to do with that. It has little, but not a lot. He said, I have marathon runners that have heart issues. He said, you got to go to the doctor. Let me ask you physically, on your physical gauge, guys, on this Father's Day weekend, when's the last time you went to the doctor? Why don't you just go get a checkup? So, I don't need a checkup. Well, I didn't think so either. And I got about that close to the big one. <laughs> Swing wide the gate, man. I was nearly going home. I'm just saying, go to the doctor. Get yourself checked physically. You can get fatigued physically. How, how, are you doing, how are you doing emotionally? What kind of friends do you have in your life? Fellas, do you have anybody that's pouring into your life? Anybody that's encouraging you? Could you tell me, if I were to ask you, who are the top five people, three people, two people in your life, other than your spouse, who are the top two people in your life that really pour into your life, encourage you, that bless you to be around? Not people you have to do stuff for all the time. Just somebody you can sit down with from time to time and talk about nothing. Who's the person or the persons you have in your life that you can have a seriously bad day and they won't go post up something stupid you said at a bad moment and just burn you? Do you have anybody in your life you can be totally honest with and totally, completely open and honest about that will not judge you, that will, do you, ha do you have anybody like that in your life? 
I'm just saying, guys, I'm concerned about you. I love you. I'm just telling you, you need some people like that in your life. Physically, watch the gauge. Emotionally, watch the gauge. Third one, spiritually, how are you doing there? Can I tell you, that's foundational to everything else. The only th stable thing you have in your life or mine is my spiritual life. My emotions waver. My physical life wanes. I mean, isn't that ironic? I'm talking about watching the gauges spiritually and we just loaded you up with donuts just a minute ago. Is there some ironic, uh, 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 something ironic about that? Oh, think about them this way at church. Can I say this? Think about them as manna that's glazed. <laughs> glazed manna. That work, Titus? Glazed manna. Okay. So just think about them that way. But the point is, how are you doing spiritually? Can I say this to you guys? One of the greatest things you could bless your family with on a Father's Day weekend is the assurance that everything's okay with you and God. I mean, just let them know that. Hey, I'm good. I'm strong in my faith. Sometimes we men assume they know that, and they may not. You, you, you might lift a huge burden off your loved ones if you just let them know, hey, just, just for the record, my faith is strong. You may not have to say it but one time, but let me, I, I can't tell you. You, you know Why? Because I have done, just as I've done hundreds of weddings, I've done hundreds of funerals. I don't mean to be Debbie Downer here, but let me tell you something. If Jesus tarries his coming, we ain't getting out of this thing alive. And one of these days, somebody just like me is going to stand over somebody just like you. And I can tell you, because I've done this enough to know, the most important and significant thing your family will hold on to is your faith. Your faith. You knew Jesus. We know where he is. We're going to be with him again. That's important. So if you hadn't settled that and you hadn't made that, that's why we do post baptisms. That's, that's a public expression of an inward experience. And, and I'm just suggesting to you guys, don't neglect that. Here was a man who was fatigued, stressed, but he did the right thing. It's my third point. It shows his faith. He trusted Jesus. When your joy's gone, when you run out of wine, can I tell you the only person that can get you back is Jesus. Mary said, I know he's the answer. Can I tell you, he's still the answer. If you're out of wine this morning, the joy is gone, the thrill is gone, you're the only one initially that will know it, but if you don't fix it, eventually everybody will know it. If that wine hadn't been replenished when it was, soon everybody in the house would have known they're out of wine. And guys, right now, you, you have a, this opportunity to fix this before it gets public, but if you don't fix this, then eventually you, your kids are gonna go, man, dad's just not the same. Your spouse is gonna go, something's changed. Your buddies are going to go, man, what's wrong with you? You're not the same person. And long to the people that you work with are going to go, dude, what, what's up? You're not. And, and the reality of it is, it's not that you're a bad guy. It's that you ran out of wine. You just ran out of wine. In the midst of doing good things and being a good man, you just ran out of wine. Happens to the best. So I'm saying recognize that if that's where you are, go to Jesus. There's a beautiful prayer in the 51st Psalm where David said, restore unto me the joy, the wine of thy salvation. Some of you just need to pray that prayer today. God, give me the wine back. Give me the joy back. Give me the thrill and the passion in life again. I pray that for you guys. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to open your word and to, to be instructed by your Holy Spirit as to what we should do and how we should live. And I pray, Father, that we won't just be hearers of your word, but that we'll be doers, that we will apply this to our life. Thank you, God, for the dads. I just, I just pray you'll bless them. Thank you for them. I, I pray for the responsibilities that they carry, for the, for the load that many of them shoulder. And so, Father, I pray that you'll bless the guys today on this Father's Day weekend. Encourage them. For anyone listening that has never trusted you, Father, I pray they'll humble their hearts and they'll say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my sin. I do believe you died on that cross and I believe you rose again with all that is in me. I trust you. May that be their prayer. And finally, Lord, for those that need someone just to pray for them before they leave, I pray as soon as I dismiss, they'll make their way here to the front and let someone here at the front spend a moment with them and pray for them. Father, we just thank you for this weekend and we, we thank you, Lord, that um, we know you're at work in lives and the hearts of people. We can sense it. And I pray now, Lord, that you'll bless us and, and bless this time that we recognize our missions team is about to leave for Uganda. I pray in a moment as we pray over them and bless them, Lord, that you will be with each one and protect them, we pray in Jesus' name.
before we go home today, we do wanna recognize our Uganda mission team. Mary, tell us a little bit about that. And hello, everybody. How are you guys doing? Hello, here's <laughs> our team. We're super excited, you guys. We leave on Saturday, and we'll go through Dubai. It's, everybody always says, how long is the flight? So you know our flight, long. DFW to Dubai, <laughs> Bill's done it, mm. is 15 hours on mm. one plane. I know it's a long <laughs> flight. And then um, we will stay there, and then the next um, day we leave that morning and we will go to Uganda and that's about a five hour flight which seems super super fast after 15 is like oh, we got this it's nothing um, so then we're going to be there um, for about 10 days or so so you guys be praying for us we're super excited to take back um, all the stuff that you guys have given for your sponsor kids and a lot of you guys have done that we've raised a lot of money with the run we raised we're taking over forty thousand dollars you guys for to start our awesome. met mom's that's village great. That's so great. our church has been phenomenal and reaching out, so thank you, thank you, thank you. We're super excited, and um, just specifically, if you're thinking, what can I pray? Write yourself a little note. Pray every day for us. For health is a big thing that we will stay strong. We'll sleep well. Um, we eat. We try to eat really healthy when we're there as well. And just that um, we can reach out. We we talk a lot about as the mission team, whether it's at the airport, we're God's vehicle. Right. The whole time that we're there, just loving on people and. Just tell them about Jesus. That's our goal for when we go. So thank you guys for supporting us. And we just wanted to pray as a team over us. And Let's we'll see you guys when we get back. All right, everybody. Let's, one final prayer over our missions team. Would you join me as we pray for them? Father, thank you for these incredible people who are going such a long way to bring your love and mercy and grace and, and goodness to, to these sweet kids. Father, we thank you for the, the mission there. We thank you for the work of that orphanage and school. And I pray that each person that goes, Lord, that they'll realize how significant their visit is going to be in the lives of these young people. These kids will never forget them. And I pray you'll protect and bless them. And I pray that they'll feel so fulfilled because they are truly carrying your love and representing this church in Uganda. Bless that work there, Father. Thank you for the privilege we have as a church of not just helping the people at our front doorstep, but helping people on the other side of the world. You said we're to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of this world. And so, Father, we as a church want to do that faithfully. I pray you'll bless them and bring them home safely, and we'll be excited to hear about all you did through their lives while they were there. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank Bye, everybody. Have a great rest of your fathers. Thank you so much for watching online with us. If you have any questions or prayer requests, please contact us so that we can follow up with you this week by visiting metchurch.com. We look forward to seeing you again next week.